This episode is brought to you by our friends at Unibuddy. Unibuddy is a student engagement platform that helps higher education recruitment, marketing, and admissions professionals attract, engage, and convert prospective students. Unibuddy helps students make one of the most important purchasing decisions of their entire life, and that decision is where to go to college. One of the ways they do this is by giving prospects real-time access to real people at your university. Here's how it works. A prospective student named Sam stumbles upon your school's business major website page, and he starts reading about your program offering. After a few seconds, a warm pop-up form invites Sam to chat with student ambassador Dan, who, you guessed it, is currently studying business at your university. After some quick niceties, Sam admits he's been looking at your school for some time now, but has yet to submit a formal inquiry or start an application. He's been to a couple of virtual recruitment events, but it's been hard to get a real feel for what life as a student, especially during these times, is actually like. Dan talks about his love of the entrepreneurship course he's taking, how challenging but rewarding Accounting 101 is, and how impressed he's been with your school's response to the challenges that COVID has thrown everyone's way. After 15 minutes of chatting with Dan, Sam books a chat with one of your admissions counselors for next week, and then he goes on to create an application account. This experience is so much more powerful than a static chat window or a scripted chatbot. Unibuddy empowers people to make better decisions through shared human experience. Oh, and by the way, this peer-to-peer engagement platform, it's just one of Unibuddy's product offerings. Wait until you see their virtual events platform. It's totally game-changing. Don't get stuck in a prospective student's college shopping cart. Make the experience of accessing personalized peer-to-peer feedback as frictionless as possible. To learn more about Unibuddy and access a plethora of free resources to help you navigate student recruitment this year, head on over to enrollify.org forward slash Unibuddy, and we'll ping you directly to Unibuddy's learning hub. I'm a content marketer, so my view of what that is is been radically shifted because of this platform okay and there's not many things that come along and make me think differently about those those principles those practices i've learned over many years um but tiktok for me it's a chaos engine is the best way i can summarize it um oh that's beautiful a chaos well, engine i like that it, it, it is though it, it thrives on chaos and things that are nonsensical which sort of takes content strategy and content marketing and, and turns it on its head it just it turns it upside down All right, Kyle, so we were just chatting offline before we hit record, and you brought up a question that I thought was like really good, and I wanted to capture it on the pod. So we, I said, can we just stop? I'm not going to answer this question. Let's just hit record. Before I ask you that question, then, and we riff on this a little bit, you are Kyle Campbell. You were at Unibuddy for what, a couple years, two, two, three years? How long were you at Unibuddy? Just, Just under a year, yeah. Just under a year. Okay. And before that, what were you doing? Uh, I was working in universities in general. So before that, I was at Nottingham Trent University, which is a, a, a large university in, in Nottingham. I was um, heading up a web team there. So content design, web development, things like that. Okay. Uh, and before that, I was a content marketing manager at Aston University. So you've been in like the content education space for a while and you sort of like thrive at the intersection of that. So you were working there, you were working at Unibody, and then you decided to you, you started Education Marketer as like a side hustle. You had like a newsletter. And I, I think that that's how I actually, I first, I first found you through your newsletter and then realized you worked at Unibuddy and I had friends at Unibuddy. And anyways, that's how we, I think, initially got connected. Um, and then Education Marketer started doing well. So you decided to go kind of all in on your on your side gig. Do I have the yeah. story like more or less correct there? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I think every content business starts as a, a side gig doesn't it and then yeah you reach that point and you you decide to do it full time and you know like most businesses sometimes they they they, they falter and, and sometimes they succeed and I'm, I'm very lucky to be on the side of something that's working out quite well yeah yeah that's awesome man and um i want to i want to dive in and maybe we'll set a, like a, a time to talk a little bit more about like how you knew it was time and 
Because uh, mm-hmm. I, I know a number of our listeners too who do work in higher ed also have things on the side that they're working on. Um, so I think that would be uh, another fun, interesting pod. But anyways, the question that you were we were about to like wrestle with together was like, as you as you have your 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 growing education marketer. And like, you might be at a point where like, you're looking for some additional help. Like, how do you even think about like bringing somebody onto your team to like help create thought leadership that is pretty niche. And like, like, how do you in like a hiring process, like discern who's like one really good at creating content and then two, like has something of value to add to the industry. And like, wh- what is like, what is that job title? Is that, is that more or less kind of the, the, the question you're wrestling with? Yeah, I mean, I, I am I am wrestling with that because I think I've I set out to run my business as a as a solo printer, and yeah. you know that I, that's that's because I I like controls the wrong words. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the, the idea of um, you, you know being ha- having an idea and then being able to to execute, um, and as part of the, the you know the products I I I um I. I sell, I, 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 sh- I share. Um, it, it's about pulling together everything's going on in, in the, the market and, and putting a lens of sense over it and presenting it to people that's meaningful for them. In, in my case, it's education marketers, but I am the one with that lens. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the challenge for me is you know, how, if I was to up, upscale, and um, be able to deliver more at once or something. I'd probably need to find another person who's got a similar perspective or PO, POV as, as I do. So, so for me at the moment, I I am looking to see if there are others like me who share like a content marketing lens, a category design lens, or, or whatever that is. But you know, so far it's it, it's quite challenging in that respect because how do you find it? You know, I mean, for me, I'm looking at LinkedIn, seeing what content people post regularly. Do they have a, a content niche? Um, are, are they committed to that niche, or are they just trying to get like likes yeah. and reactions and, and things? And you know, there's lots of people on, on LinkedIn who have posts that perform well, um, but there's very few people who consistently talk about the same topic and and live in the same yeah. space that you and I do. Um, so maybe maybe there isn't like a person who fits the exact POV that's mine. Maybe that's the issue. Maybe I need to look at other areas that you know, within education marketing that I could service. There you go. I've answered my own question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, that's the challenge for me. I, I don't know how you go about it. I mean, you actually have a very successful podcast network, and I know you're introducing more podcasts into that of different speakers and different hosts. So, yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to hear how how you're approaching that issue. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I I think so. What what I learned is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is that's my preferred platform. I love LinkedIn, um, and I think that's just because like I've kind of figured out like like I'm long winded as anyone who's ever listened to an Enroll Five podcast knows, and LinkedIn just gives you gives you more real estate to be long winded, which I very much appreciate. Um, and but what I have found is that I think the best content creators live on uh, lived on, live on Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. And what I what I mean is like people people that can kind of parse out a good idea that might be happening in a different industry, and do the work of figuring out what is the application in education, what is the application in, in, in higher ed, whether that's a marketing application or, or a recruitment application. And I have been more impressed, quite frankly, with like the the talent, if you will, on Twitter than than on LinkedIn. And I also think that there is something to be said for the people that can communicate a compelling idea within the context of a tweet, right? And or and or a thread where you do have to you have to be more discerning with your words. You can't like LinkedIn you, you can do all this fun formatting stuff. You can like, you know, hide the meat but behind like the read more, right? Like you 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 can do all that. You can figure out like how many spaces I need before that read more kicks in and and all that fun stuff. And the Mm. algorithm rewards that you can't do that with Twitter. Um, And so anyways, all that is to say, I've been more impressed with the the talent pool on Twitter. So what what we've been doing, and I've never actually talked about this on, on our podcast before, but um, you know, first time for everything you asked, what I did is I I went onto Twitter and I I found people who were working in higher ed in some capacity, either they, or currently like a VP of marketing or a CMO, 
or they were, you know, they had been in higher ed, but now worked on the agency side of things, et cetera. And I start, I followed them. Like I, I followed like a ton of people. And then over the course of three months, I just like observed like who was talking about things, what were they talking about and how were people responding to the things that they were talking about? And then I DM'd a few of those people and said, Hey, like, I'd love to chat with you. I've been following you for three months. I like your content. Other people clearly like your content. You, you can dialogue well, you have original thoughts. Um, and like, you're generally a positive person. I think that, I think the general positivity and the general like optimistic outlook has to be there. There's a ton of people on social that like have great performing content, but it's so negative, especially in <laughs> higher ed. It's so political. It's so negative. And like, not that those things aren't important, but like, I personally, I just, I, I, it, it's easy to be a, nays- a naysayer. It's a much harder to create value. And so if you're creating value and not just being a naysayer, like I want you in my circle. Right. So anyways, mm-hmm. I DM these people and got on a call with them and said, Hey, look, I can, I can give you a little bit of money. Like I can, I can, you know, essentially like give you a stipend, but we'll take care of hosting and managing your entire show. Um, what do you think? And you know, they, three of them, uh, there was a few other people that responded in the end, we ended up going forward with three folks who are Corinne Myers, Jamie hunt and uh, Jeremy tears who are all, you know, very different uh, individuals, but all kind of fit that criteria of good content creators know a lot about higher ed. I'd followed them for three months to make sure that they could be consistent and then set and then approach them with this, this opportunity. So that's a long winded way of saying Kyle, that my recommendation, if I were you, and it doesn't even have to be Twitter. It could be LinkedIn, but go and follow people in the industry and then track them for a two, three month period of time, assess like the, the kind of content they're, they're creating, assess how other people are interacting with that content, and then use that information to start a conversation. That's, that's what I would do. I mean, that's awesome. And then I like, that's very much in keeping with, you know, where marketing's going in general. So you're using Enrollify almost as like a, like a plat- platform so a brand is a platform rather than like a billboard i guess uh, but that's really exactly nice. yeah that's so using, that, that's using the attempt like, love it i, I just yeah. love the, the community angle there and it just feels like you've got the right attitude from the offset so i appreciate that it's really cool we'll see man we've got uh a lot to prove uh this stuff is fun, <laughs> <as you> know. <laughs> but dude okay so the, the real reason we are chatting today is because You've been posting like incredible content and I was, you know, flat, you know, giving you some kind of words right before we hit record here. But for in, in all seriousness, for our listeners, if you, if you're not following Kyle on, on LinkedIn already, you, you're really missing out. There are lots of voices in this space, lots of, you know, great, great folks who are contributing and adding value, but Kyle consistently uh, makes me think twice about something or makes me reconsider a, a previous notion that I've had. And, few people, few, few people in our, in our beautiful, but like niche, you know, industry, uh, <laughs> solicit that sort of response from me when I'm scrolling, but, but Kyle's content does. So all you know, his, his, all his social channels will be linked in the show notes below. So you can go and, and follow him if you're not already, but you recently, Kyle, you recently posted on, on LinkedIn about some new observations you've had around TikTok and TikTok, I feel like is, is this platform that obviously everyone's talking about and has been talking about for a while. And I would argue a lot of people in higher ed are talking about TikTok now, but it's still this like really scary, like pool, right? It, it's, it's like, you know, when you're a kid and you have like the little kid pool and then there's like the big kid pool with like the massive diving board and like, you're terrified to jump off and you know, once you jump off and get in, you'll, you'll be able to swim and, you know, you'll want to do it again, but like getting up, right. Getting t- into the big, kid pool is just absolutely terrifying. I feel like that's the way that people kind of think about TikTok. It's like, it seems so overwhelming, so scary. And so they kind of stay comfortable in like the kiddie pool, like the Instagrams and the Facebooks of the world. Cause like they, they know those <laughs> pools well. So uh, I, let's, let's just start by like, I, I'd love just your unfiltered candid thoughts. Like talk, talk to me about like where you're at with TikTok. Like h- how are you thinking about the platform? What are some things, if anything that you've, learned recently about the platform um and and just any other sort of like general observations about do's and don'ts with respect to getting started with tiktok yeah for me um, i'm probably been looking at tiktok quite closely for about a year now maybe a little bit more um 
but I've had my, I'm a content marketer. So my view of like what that is, is been radically shifted because of this platform okay and there's not many things that come along and make me think differently about those those principles and those practices i've learned over many years um but tiktok for me it's a chaos engine is the best way i can summarize it Ooh, that's beautiful a chaos engine i like that it is though it, it thrives on chaos and things that are nonsensical which sort of takes content strategy and content marketing and, and turns it on its head it just turns it upside down right because, you know, as a, as a content marketer, it's all about building an audience and consistency and trust. And, you know, you build up this um, gradual momentum over time. Whereas TikTok, y- you can do something that's completely mad and chaotic. And <laughs> suddenly this, this one piece becomes like your, your avenue into like new levels of um, being known for something, right? So my, my first sort of well, when I happened across TikTok, it was via a um, a viral TikTok that came from a guy who was drinking a bottle of ocean spray on a skateboard. And he's going to work, he's going across a highway, it's early morning, and I think Fleetwood Mac's playing um, Dreams, Fleetwood Mac Dreams playing in the background. Just a guy on a skateboard, he's got 10 million views. Yeah. And it, that just changed his life, you know? And, you know, on other platforms, you go viral, and it, it sometimes doesn't actually have any impact on what you're doing day to day. So like people who go viral on LinkedIn, it, it doesn't actually change anything for them, really. They have that one piece of content and then it's just back to the way it was the day after. But with TikTok, it just opens up this avenue for this experimentation. So it is a chaos engine and it, all those principles of content marketing, you know, they kind of get thrown out the window to an extent. Yeah, so that's, that's my first like um, sort of thoughts on the platform, how different it is to what's come before. Hey, all Zach here from Enrollify. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions and higher ed technology shows that are jam packed with stories, ideas and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. Our shows feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Mickey Baines, Jeremy Tears, Jamie Hunt, Corinne Myers, Jamie yeah. Gleason, and many, many more. You can learn more about the Enrollify Podcast Network at podcast.enrollify.org. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea. Find yours at podcast.enrollify.org. I I love that that framing. Um, it's it's so beautiful, and I. I recently started dabbling in, I, I, I probably, I probably didn't even download TikTok until like six months ago. Mm. And then I, this maybe sounds a little nutty, but like I've been committing to like, I, I literally is part of my morning routine. I'll spend 15 to 30 minutes just like scrolling on TikTok. And I, I have to set reminders for myself because again, it's still not my, like my preferred platform, but it is it's so interesting and it's so compelling and it's obviously where so much attention is right now. So anyway, so I've been doing this for about six months and um, for a little side project that uh, my wife and I have, I recently launched like our, our own TikTok for our side hustle. And, um, and I, I've been experimenting. So I've created like three TikToks that are all very different from each other just to see like, you know, what works and, and what doesn't work and why. And, Basically, I've concluded that I have no idea like what what really works and and what doesn't work because like the things that I'm like, oh, other people are doing this. This is going to work. I'm using like the trending music and, it, you know, I have like six views. And then I do this other thing with like, I upload 10, 10 photos using one of their like templates. And then like it's got like 5000 views, right? Like, it, I mean, it's just like the disparity is is insane. Um, And I I think what's difficult, quite frankly, and I think what you're getting at here is like. There, there is an art and a science to social on other platforms. Like once you figure out like how to write a good LinkedIn post, you can kind of rinse and repeat that LinkedIn post, right? Like yeah. you can say the same thing a hundred different times and it'll get roughly the same reach, right? Same thing on Twitter. Like you can think fig- once you figure out how to write a good thread, like the formula is baked in. And of course, algorithms change. They, you know, depending on how big you're following, th- those are indicators. Those are factors that are, that are important. But I feel like with TikTok, it's really hard to figure out what the science is um, mm. between b- behind like making making great TikTok, and 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 therefore, 
I really do think of all the platforms right now, TikTok's where you you need to be the most creative. It's it's where you need to let the art take over and just focus on the art. Don't try to optimize. Don't try to templatize. Don't try to you know. Uh, don't don't try to mirror what you think the algorithm rewards. Just create something artistic, right? And let you know, uh, let the algorithm al- algorithm do its thing. Again, I have no, I have, I have no way of proving that that's like sound science. But I've tried the science. I've been doing all the things that like people say you should do, and it, it, there's no, there's no like method to the madness as far as far as I'm concerned. So, anyways, that was a lot. What are what are some of your reactions to that? I think I think focusing on the creativity and that sort of chaotic element is really important because it sort of undoes the idea of the template doesn't it and i'm thinking of all the i think the recent trends are kicking off in the uk so one that's everywhere right now is it's bingley mega chippy now i don't think that's reached you it probably won't have <laughs> but it's literally <laughs> just a chip shop in the mid a chip shop in the uk as people get fish and chips i don't know if you have that where you are um but it's a big thing over here right so yeah. this is just a random sort of like chip shop middle of nowhere it's just not in the nowhere it's in the suburb but you, it's nondescript right but because someone did a top 10 list of like chip shops to visit in the area, this is suddenly blown up. But it wasn't that list. It was someone picking up on that one shop in that list. And then mm. other people did it and more momentum comes. And apparently there's like a local music festival. So there's a bunch of young people using TikTok and it kicks off. They visit. And then suddenly someone writes a theme tune for the chip shop. So all these different memeable elements come together and it turns it into this huge viral trend. So it wasn't wasn't just one piece of content that went viral. It, it was the the collective movement of lots of different attention being paid to this one thing that makes yeah. it now an active trend on TikTok, which I didn't know about a week ago. So it it again, it's not like the one idea almost. It's is your content something that has created a movement that others jump onto and, and you know we talk about this in HE as well don't we it's it's not necessarily the content we put out on you know our accounts it's what other students are saying about us and how they raise the profile of what we're doing on on their account right and for me that's a bit of a, a missed opportunity in HE because I know with lots of social media in the way it has been in the past that the focus is very much on the university account and then using ambassadors to create content for that but a lot of the success yeah, yeah. stories I'm seeing in HE at the moment are, you know, content producers behind these these TikTok accounts who understand that their you know their role is and, and to borrow a phrase from my my colleague um, Mickey who looks after um, University of Chichester's account, she thinks of herself like a Hollywood producer. So she pulls all this stuff together, looks at talent, the best creators, and then she'll bring them to you know, the university's platform, but then also work in collaboration to raise the profile of the university on theirs. So it's a very different style of, of thinking um, that we've been used yeah. to in social teams in the past. And I don't know if that's a, the same the sort of patterns that you've been seeing as well, but I think TikTok, the way it is and the, the sort of virality and the, 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 the views that videos get, you know, the, 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 the volume that it's attracting has actually forced that, that transition to happen quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, what you, you recently posted this, this great, uh, this great post on LinkedIn about branded missions on, on TikTok. Mm-hmm. And uh, could you just, could you just share a little bit more about like what that is, what you've observed yeah. and where, where you think like higher ed can leverage these? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, in higher ed, I, I think the words on the the lips of people like in marketers and the sector, it's always about authenticity and, and user generated content and, and, you know, all things around ambassador marketing. So what branded missions does is it allows you to scale that sort of content, but from outside of your existing pool of, of ambassadors. So um, for me, it's quite a revelation for, for marketing to see a sort of technology exist. So it, you, you simply open TikTok's you know, app, Um, And then you put in almost like a, your mission, your sort of branded brief, if you like, the sort of content you want TikTok's creators to create for you. And then the app simply just sends it out to its entire creative pool. So creators then have the opportunity to respond with the videos that they want to create for you. And the highest performing ones, you then put ad dollars behind. 
So I don't know anything like this that's existed in the past, especially yeah. not natively built into an app. Usually it's like a third party or, or something like that providing that service. Um, but this for me is just, it's revolutionary. You know, yeah. it's finally allowing brands to scale um, community and user generated content in a, in a meaningful way. And that's managed from, from the app itself. Usually to do these sort of deals, it's highly complicated because you need to yeah. source creators and pay them individually contracts and all that but everything's taken care of in the app i mean i can't believe it's not being spoken about more widely <laughs> also dude i'm so glad you said this yeah i i don't i don't know why there's not more content out about this i yeah. I, I really i really don't especially especially in higher ed like this is a no-brainer especially for higher ed marketers who have no time they've got limited resources they've got limited budget anyways like the amount of time that this reduces, it puts the onus on creators. And then you're, you're combing through content that have, people have already selected, like people have already created and then throwing ad dollars behind top performing stuff. I mean, it's like you've taken all the friction out of trying to find influencers, like out of the equation and then having to work with them, right? Like it's, it's really cool. The other thing, the other interesting thing about TikTok, TikTok just generally as a platform that, that, um, that I've observed is like every account, it's almost... TikTok views anyone that has an account as a creator versus every other social platform views people as users, right? And I and and an example of this is like, you know, like when you go and you click on your your TikToks, it'll show you like, hey, how is this content performed compared to other creators like you? Like, hey, this is better than this is performed better than 70 other 75% of creators like you. Now, I'm sure that creators like you is some, you know, score that they have based off of your following, how long you've been on the platform, kind of content you create, et cetera. But, but then it, again, to your point about data, it shows the creator like, Hey, this is where people dropped off. This is where people stopped watching your video. Like this is the, your, your, you know, percentage completion rate, like that information in the hands of just a, in a nobody, a nobody creator on TikTok, like that is incredibly powerful stuff. Right. And literally like, you know, I finally posted, we posted our first TikTok like a week and a half ago, right? Like brand new, we finally got around to posting anything. We'd been, I'd been observing for a while and I, I'm getting data that I feel like I, I should only have access to if I had like a business account, right? Or like a, like a, you know, a, a Facebook ads manager kind of deal. I'm getting that natively in the app. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that, that the framing there of TikTok viewing everybody as a creator versus a user is is a very interesting and you know arguably smart uh positioning in a world where you know many people do want to be creators many people think that they you know are creators or, or can be creators so that's that's an interesting sort of like position that the that the platform's taken yeah 100 percent, and and i think it's in incredibly deliberate as well i mean it there's loads of research coming out now that the, you know the gener generation a like the, the generation after generation z are you know their their primary mode they want to grow up into the, the job they want to do when they, they grow up as a youtuber creator but the, the funny thing yeah. is is it, like all of this stuff is it's now possible and you know a few years ago in order to sort of make it as a as a creator you needed to be an influencer but now you don't you know, there's there's like an emerging, but uh, better phrase, better, want a better phrase, like a middle class of creators, right? So, I think I read recently there's, there's 28 million people making a life as a creator who earn around 40,000 pounds a year. So that's a decent salary from from the yeah. work you're doing in your content. But there's still this myth that to be a creator and, and an influencer, you have to be an influencer, and you don't. So there's all of this opportunity is now available for this, this creator economy to take advantage of those opportunities. And I think TikTok gets this more than say some of those legacy platforms um, that have been around a bit longer. YouTube is pretty good at it. They, they kind of get what the creative thing is, but you don't hear about a Facebook creator, do you? Or a meta creator. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just not where it is at the moment. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's deliberate. It knows what it's doing. And I think it's a very smart business decision. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Where where do you see where do you see like opportunity for higher ed right now on, on TikTok? Like what is the I've asked a couple of people these this question and I feel like, you know, there's there's no right answer here, but 
how how should sort of your your average institution who's got a little bit of budget to devote to TikTok, but you know, not not gobs of money? What, what if you've got let's say fifty thousand you know dollars or fifty thousand um, pounds to spend on on TikTok, uh, whether that's TikTok ads, whether that's hiring you know creators, whether that's tapping into influencers, whatever it might be, like how where do, where do you think sort of the the opportunity is to to spend that money in like the most meaningful way right now if you're an institution. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, I mean, I'd be spoken about brand admissions. I'd put a, a decent chunk of it into there um, because that can do all the hard work of sourcing creators for you at scale. But then I think with the the remainder of the budget and the bulk of the budget, the team behind the, the TikTok account should definitely search out the, the leading creators them, themselves who are already talking about the university and the brand and, and work to do either sponsorship deals with them or bring them on board as a creator working in partnership there's a lot of stuff you can do for not for free because you know staff time's money isn't it um but there's i think there's a lot of missed opportunities for universities to not jump on trends but respond to popular tiktok videos with their own expertise and you know that i don't know if you've noticed and, and i imagine you have but on tiktok there's so much misinformation and bogus advice being given out and i'm thinking along the lines of like <laughs> health and well-being um finance things like that and you know i i saw a video recently um from like a someone who's saying oh you should eat grass that's a great idea and then someone jumped on that and said no you probably shouldn't do that for these reasons but i'm thinking what's a university equivalent so a university equivalent would be like someone gives really bad financial advice or business advice and then a university academic or whatever the, the creator is then responds on university account on a, is it called a stitch, isn't it? When you put two things together. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, that would be great. You know, they respond to a popular video, which is wildly misinformed with an actual informed and entertaining answer. I think that could do really well, you know, and it's a good way to get the university in on these sort of trends in a, in a meaningful way. Um, the other Dude, thing- on, from- Sorry, on, on that note real fast, uh, hmm. that's, a, that's a really, that's a great idea. And something that just popped into my mind is like, it'd be cool get get like get like a student ambassador or somebody again that is good at creating content and have them go and sit down with a faculty member and do like a quick like all right you know dr so and so uh should you eat grass right like you know and and, and, ha- and have it be like like this fun like little dialogue between like hey you know dr so and so heard about this on tiktok what do you think right and you know and 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 that way you bring in your faculty members as like the thought leaders in the respective space that they that they are onto you know into the content but you're not asking dr so-and-so to freaking download and get on tiktok and you know accidentally send out some weird ass you know photo or video of themselves because they don't know what they're doing like that's a that's a super like you know cool easy way to to show off your your faculty thought leadership um, and potentially like build a distinct kind of like unique brand around how your university does TikTok. Anyway, sorry, go, go back to your idea, but just wanted to riff off of that great idea that you had. No, 100%. Um, the, the, other, the other idea I've got is, is quite, quite an easy one to pick up. A lot of content I see doing well from, from universities at the moment is when they film their facilities, but things that are quite spectacular uh, to look at. Um, I saw a, a video probably like a year ago now, in fairness, but um, it, it literally showed molten glass falling through a machine and the, gra- the glass crystallizes and it's, it's quite beautiful. But I'm thinking there's so many universities out there with like incredible equipment and facilities that have visual results. You, you know, sharing content like that does surprisingly well. And, and, you know, if you shared something like that, like a facilities tour on YouTube, it doesn't do half as well, does it? But if you have something that's spectacular to look at in your campus, then, you know, capture that and share that on the app. Because it, it will find an audience, not just for the university, but people who appreciate like that sort of kind of weird and wonderful beauty uh, in general. Um, I think there's also an opportunity for a university to like have a have a side account where they just blow stuff up. Because um, I've seen <laughs> like, I saw, what did I see? I saw some stuff from like Plymouth University recently, and they were just sharing like um, experiments where you know they, they mix two chemicals together or they blow up a bunch of ping pong balls or whatever. And it's it's something spectacular to look at. 
Um, so I don't know. I think there's something definitely in the visual facilities aspect to, as well, a bit more of a safe option if that's what you're there for. I that, that reminds me of um, who was the what was the brand? Remember the guy that was? I think this was like an early YouTube sensation that would like mm. blend, like put anything in a blender. Yeah, yeah. Was that what, what was My the name of the? Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it's it's that same kind of concept, right? Like, and you know that that blender would I, I don't even remember the brand so. Yeah. But, but again, I think this was slightly before like my time, but anyways, I, I remember, I remember the content and, you know, I know that, that the brand of blender like did stupendous. So like, what does it look like to, again, find something that's on brand with your institution, whether it's showing off, you know, your uh, science department, your engineering department, your you know English department, whatever it is. And then, and then, yeah, find something fun. That's like just quippy and entertaining to do. That's it's pure brand ad advertising, but then you grow a reputation as like, oh yeah, you're oh you're the school that like blends phones. Okay, like interesting. Like <laughs> you, you become memorable. You become you become top of mind uh, at the very least. You 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 just on on the mark with that. I mean, um, again, some of the, the stuff I've been seeing coming out of Chichester's accounts in in the UK that they are becoming known as the university on TikTok. And that's yeah. it's very powerful. Um, they've got 20,000 followers, more than 20,000 followers, and they've only got 5,000 students. So clearly people are subscribing Jeez. to that content because it's entertaining, it's enjoyable, you know, they, they want to be there. And, you know, the, the the account producer, the person who looks after the account has done research into, you know, what's the average age of the, the people following us. And they tend to be a lot younger than you think. So for, for a lot of them, it's actually you know, the first time they've ever come across a university in, in a certain way. Mm. So that's, that's incredibly powerful. And if you think about how people typically discover universities, it's, it's via fairs or it's, it's via a prospectus or a website, but this is like being presented to them in from an entertaining lens, you know, that, that changes things that makes you quite attractive as an option. And there is evidence to suggest that because of the quality of the content on their account, you know, students are actually firming their offers and, and choosing those institutions that they're actually making comments about having done so on the, on the account and the content itself. So it works and it's risky on the outset because it's quite entertaining off the wall, but you, you know, it's clearly delivering results. So it, it's, um, it's, un it's never been happening before in, in HE. I've never seen anything like it. So it's, it's definitely worth like picking this stuff up if you aren't already. Hey everybody, Zach from Enrollify here. I want to tell you about an exciting upcoming event brought to you by our friends at Element 451. And first of all, if you haven't heard of Element 451, they are an advanced student engagement CRM providing higher ed institutions with a competitive admissions advantage from recruitment to enrollment through the use of AI, student behavior data, and modern marketing automation. I like to say that if HubSpot and Slate had a baby, it'd be Element 451. Anyhow, the team has put together an incredible conference in Raleigh, North Carolina on July 26th and 27th called the Engage Summit, and I'll be speaking at it. The Engage Summit features incredible speakers like Artis Kadu, founder and CEO of Element 451, Wanda Pog, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at VaynerMedia, Lenel Hahn from Southeast Missouri State University, and many others. I'll be presenting a three-part workshop entitled What Steve Jobs, Don Draper, and Brene Brown Can Teach Us About How to Attract, Engage, and Inspire the Next Generation of Students. It's going to be a party. The best part, this event is totally free. If you've been a longtime fan of Enrollify, I'd love to meet you in person at the Engage Summit. You can learn more about this dynamic event at engage.element451.com. That's engage.element451.com. Or if you'd like, feel free to shoot me an email directly at zach, Z-A-C-H, at enrollify.org, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have about the event. All right, folks, hope to see you all there. Yeah, two, two quick follow-up, um, a story, and then uh, I don't know if you've ever followed the Colorado School of Mines tech, on TikTok, but I talked I talked to their, like, I don't know if he was their director of marketing or something like that, but anyways, he, he oversaw TikTok at Colorado School of Mines, and... Um, they 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 did something super cool like a series with their president where like they had their president like 
lay on like a bed of nails. And then they had their president try to like break this like box with like a hammer. And like, it was literally just like, you know, showing off different, and, and he, the, you know, the president would try to like break this box with a hammer in front of like their brand new, like beautiful engineering building or something like that. Right. Like it was very strategically done, but the, that content went viral and like, and, and they're like a pretty niche, they're, you know, a reputable brand and institution, but they're still pretty niche. Like they're pretty small. Um, and they have, you know, some of the best TikToks I've ever seen. Um, but then also to your point about younger audiences discovering universities and or university content on TikTok, I was just in uh, Boston last week and I was talking to my niece who's 12 years old, 13 years old, I think. Um, and she's on TikTok. And I was asking her, oh, she, no, actually, she knows I like work in higher ed marketing-ish, but she, I didn't even ask her. She like proactively was like, yeah, like, I think like, I'm going to go to UCLA. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, why? Why, why do you want to go to UCLA? She's like, well, you know, it's California and, you know, it, it just, the, their students just like look cool. Like, it looks like they're like doing some really cool things there. I was like, oh, cool. Like, have you like been on their website or like, like how, like, how do you, how do you know there's cool things? She's like, oh, no, no, I, I've never been on the website. Um, she's never even been to California, by the way. She's like, but I, but I see them on TikTok. And she, again, <laughs> she's, she's like 12, 13 years old. And she's decided that she wants to go to UCLA. I, I've actually never even been on UCLA's TikTok. So I have no idea how good it is. But like, that is, I was like, so fascinated by that. I was like, wow, she's never even been on their website. Okay. She's never read their Facebook page. You know, she's never even received mail from them yet because she's freaking 13 years old. But she wants to go to UCLA because she saw some kid on TikTok doing something that she thought was interesting and therefore decided that cool people go to UCLA, right? Yeah. yeah like, it, mind-boggling. Yeah, it's it's a completely different style of marketing. And I think we've all become conditioned to think about marketing as a funnel when a lot of it happens outside the funnel. There's different ways you prefer to, to refer to that. It's like dark social is one of them. But a lot of the times when people come to your website they've already made their decision you yeah, know and they did yeah. it outside of your marketing funnel so and that's a great example of where that is i mean you, you, your niece there she's she's consumed content from something and she's already formed that opinion whether that opinion will change later down the line it might um but a lot of students are making those decisions now they they've yeah. already made their decision a lot of the time by the by the time they've received your first promotional mail so what we need to be doing as, as practitioners in this space is, is working out how we can become discoverable and then be there for students when they are ready to commit. Um, and yeah. at the moment, that, that's a rare thing. I, I don't see that very often. Um, some universities are very forward thinking are, are getting that, but others are very wedded to that idea of, of the funnel, which is great for internal processes and monitoring applications, but it, it's quite limiting when you're thinking about the impact and influence of, of your marketing. Yeah. I, I'm also thinking like, given, given, you know, I'm sure this is true in the UK too, but it's increasingly true in the US. Like everyone's been talking about the demographic cliff of 2026 and how hard it's going to be for colleges and universities to recruit quality students. And, you know, people have talked about that uh, to kingdom come, but I think we can all agree that it's only going to get more competitive to recruit students to our respective institutions. And so my, my question is like, what what can UCLA like give to Sophia like right now as a 13 year old who thinks that they have cool TikTok but like is, is there anything like that is there anything more like they could do to establish some sort of relationship with her like right now you know she's a view on she's views on their TikToks right like and that's that's great and you know I also want to respect the fact that she's also freaking 12 13 years old and like <laughs> she shouldn't she shouldn't be receiving like mail from you know from you for 5 years 6 years but like but right like it does raise the question okay if you are establishing a relationship with somebody when they're a lot younger if you've been discovered like what are the right the mechanics like 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 what are what are the things that you should be offering and like one thing that comes to mind is like like Zimi these you know which I think is just this incredible app um, that's going to revolutionize how that is revolutionizing how students think about their college search process and how they make their decisions on where to go to school. Like is, 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 is should UCLA in, in some of their TikToks, especially the ones that are like maybe geared towards a slightly younger audience, 
should there be more direct tie-ins to like come join our Zemi community? Like come join, like come find us on Zemi, and that's where you establish your you know initial relationship. Um, I, I think that I guess what I'm getting at is as thing as it as the talent pool as as attracting quality prospective students becomes increasingly challenging, the smartest of schools are going to start their recruitment earlier, right? And and younger. And so what are what are the ways to effectively capitalize on the fact that right now, Sophia, as a 13 year old, believes that she's going to go to UCLA, like, awesome. How does UCLA take that, that interest, that attraction, and in an appropriate and strategic fashion, nurture Sophia so that by the time she is right, a junior in in high school, they can effectively, you know, go after her. her in theory, she needs less information and less convincing because she's, you know, been with you along the way. And I do think it's hard for many people probably to like think in those terms because they're just focused on recruiting their class for, you know, next fall. But I do think like the smartest higher ed marketers need to be thinking in this fashion because it's it's the future. Um, the the pool of prospective students is just getting smaller. You gotta get you gotta get more creative. And one of the ways to get more creative is to think a little bit, you know, more strategically about when you try to establish a relationship with somebody. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. And uh, I think with the, in terms of what, what you could be sharing with that person to, to, to nurture them, if you like, I think there's, there's clearly a success there of proving that they discover you in a channel. So that that's you've been, been discovered. So for me, in order to keep that relationship going, there's, there's several things really. Um, one would be to consistently deliver it continue to deliver content in that channel that is that is meaningful and, and keeps that audience member engaged and entertained if it's if it's TikTok. The other is to take that success from that channel and once you've expertly mastered the delivery in that channel, might be a bit of a push there, um, only then do you diversify to other ones. Um, mm. Because we, we know that the a, a student who accepts like an, an offer um they usually have heard from you in several different channels consistently over time they're more likely to set their offer if they have so is there a way that you could almost create like a content ecosystem where you know you're you're sharing like excerpts from your your podcast on a different channel in your your tiktok feed but repurposing that content in in a meaningful way so you know you get people moving between those content properties but always being nurtured in that that ecosystem and then they they convert when they're then they're ready rather than you know who happen to keep doing pushes constantly so it's again it's a very different style of thinking about marketing um one that's very incredibly hard to measure but yeah you know that will definitely have its own set of challenges but if you look what's happening in a lot of ed tech at the moment and and um even b2b marketing there's there's that seems to be where it's going you know, in, in 2012, a lot of information was sort of locked away and you had to go through businesses and companies to get it. But but now it's everywhere. So it's about discoverability more so than it ever has been. So that's that requires a very different model. Um, and it's a very exciting time um, to be a marketer because of it. Yeah, and piggybacking off of that, I, I think social proof has just become all the more influential in a decision-making process. Like now, I didn't even do this like three or four years ago, but like if I've heard, if somebody recommends like a brand or like a service, like for me, like if it's, whether it's Enrollify related or just like personal, the very first thing that I do is I go look that company or that service up on, on social media. And if like, if what I find is like, oh, there's seven followers and no activity since November 19th, 2020, like, uh, it, it 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 would be dramatic to say that that in and of itself would like make my decision for like whether or not I move forward with the product or service, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that like it strongly influences me in in a negative or positive way, depending on that that activity. And the same thing goes with like hiring people, right? Or like wanting, or or even like when you know people, you, you, I'm sure you get like recruiter calls and whatnot. It's like going up and looking up some of these companies and some of these people. I like, I guess I hate that I think this, I don't know if I hate that I think this, but regardless of how I feel about it, I do think a particular way based off of like what I see on social. And so I, I think that that's only with, with next generations, 
that's only going to matter even more, which is, you know, one of the reasons too, I think institutions have to become savvy on how to build their own personal brands, leaders within these institutions on social. Like it's, it's not going to be something that is like, you know, if we get, if we have time, we'll get to this. Like this is becoming incredibly important from a recruitment standpoint, from a talent acquisition standpoint, from a brand standpoint, and it's only going to increase in its importance. And so uh, I know I'm, you know, getting on my soapbox here and whatnot, but I do think like there's, there's big opportunity for folks in higher ed right now. Like there are very few players that are doing this well. If you want to stand out, like the beautiful thing about our industry is there's a lot of room to stand out because there's not a lot of people that are doing this well. Yeah, um, I I can definitely echo that. And I've seen some institutions move in to, to think more in that way. There's, there's one in the UK called University Academy 92. It's a fairly new university. Um, and their staff are all over LinkedIn. Um, and I, I, I think they've wow. got a few kind of LinkedIn in, influences within that that cohort of staff and they know how to use the platform um and you know people in mm-hmm. higher ed are talking mm-hmm. about them they're, they're reaching out to students they they share like new starters in the institution like you sort of respect from like a, a large scale SAS appointment in that sort of way and big talent and all that and it's fascinating to watch because they're, they're about I'd say probably about three or four years ahead of where a lot of people are and it'll become more common over the next few years, but it's, it's just so refreshing to see, you know, an institution and it's, it's marketing team and it's recruitment team thinking in the way that you, you have just described. Yeah. And, and you know, to make, to make it personal too, like I know, like if I was, if I was decided to forget and rollify and like go work inside higher ed proper, there are, you know, three people that I would go work for. I'd go work for, Jenny Petty at the University of Montana, or Jamie Hunt at Miami University in Ohio, or Ethan Braden at University of Purdue, at, at Purdue University, University of Purdue. Um, and, and the reason is because I understand how they think based off of, because I've been following them for forever. Like, I, and I, I understand they know what they're talking about. They they care a lot about their own personal brand, and therefore they must care deeply and understand the needs of the institution's brand, right, and and their team's respective brands, and so. Like the the funny thing is like, I don't think this will ever happen, but like if I did decide to do something like that, like I am heavily influenced because I follow these people, right? Like, and from a talent acquisition standpoint, especially in higher ed, where like we had, like we need great people working in house at, at our, at our institutions. We, we absolutely need more and more and more of that. And so if you're a leader listening to this, like, I think one of the most, one of the ways to, to do that, that's not easy, but you know, simple with respect to like, doesn't take a, you don't have to have a degree in rocket science to figure out how to post on LinkedIn or Twitter, right? Like th- this is this is something that is within your control that with a little bit of time every day, you can kind of grow and perfect. And like, you know this, Kyle, I'm sure since you started going, you've been a content marketer for years. I feel like you've really doubled down and started building your, your own personal brand by publishing very regularly, very consistently. Yep. And I'm sure like the number of opportunities that have come because of that, is is significantly greater than you know when you weren't doing that or when you're doing it less and so i think that that's that's a big takeaway for anyone listening today too is creating content isn't just about self-promotion and i think that's the other thing people are like well i, I don't want to like you know brag like you know I, i'm a humble person great yes yes but don't even think of it. it's not for you right like it's maybe it's a little bit for you it's to attract other people to your organization it's to inspire other people to think differently Right. And that that should be the primary motivator. Yeah, always. Um, any any posts I ever write, I always think of the audience first. I honestly, I don't care about me. And <laughs> I, I don't know how some people manage to write <laughs> about them, themselves and, and and their career journey so consistently. I'd, I'd find that very challenging. And occasionally I will talk about you know, my, my business because it's a content business and it is relevant to some of the stuff that I post. But because I know it is relevant to, to the audience. And yeah, I mean, posting on LinkedIn in daily has certainly taught me a lot about what kind of posts work. And, and you are right. I mean, as little as posting like consistently for a month on LinkedIn, I got opportunities. And it's yeah. because I didn't talk about business once. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think people realize that. You know, it's such a powerful platform. 
Um, so yeah, if people are listening, they're looking to get started on LinkedIn, I'm happy to have a, a conversation with them about it, but you don't need to post about yourself. You just think about the audience, think about the problem you can help people solve and just show them how to solve it without you. And then they will get in touch to talk to you about it. It's, it's, it's amazing, but it's just how it happens in real life, really just on a, on a digital platform. Yeah. And honestly, I feel like what it does is it requires you to become a more reflective person, which like is very important. Like if you're trying to think about like, what can I post that will be, that will, you know, add value to people, to people's feeds. Like it requires you to slow down and like turn on your brain. Right. Like, and, and I think like none, we, we don't do that enough. Um, and I know that like, since I've, I, I feel like since I've started posting consistently and whatnot, my own perspective on things have changed. I, I feel like I'm a more optimistic, like happier person simply because in order to post something, I have to stop and think, right? Like I have to, I have to actually like reflect and think, huh, like what do I have to say? And so if, if it's like, wow, I have nothing to say. Okay. What, what happened in the previous week? And like, why didn't I get time to do the thing that I love, which is to create like what, what got in the way? Okay. Next week, I can't let these things come up because I need to have something to reflect on so that I can post something on social. Right. Like, and I think that like that, that critical thought, like, it, it's even if you don't post anything at all, like drafting social posts in and of itself will, I think, inspire you to be a, a, a better creator, help you, uh, you know, be a happier person simply because you're doing something that so many of us don't feel like we ever get time to do, which is to stop and, and think. Yeah. I, I use, um, I use notion to address some of those issues. So I have it on my phone and I have it on my, my laptop. So if I ever get a minute and I'm out and I need to get an idea down, I always have the same posts open in the, the browser um, with everything else. So it all updates together. And yeah, working in a, writing at a regular time is really important as well. I always try and write in the mornings. I mean, it becomes part of a habit then. You feel mm. bad if you miss it and you make the time for it. But I mean, you know, if you are trying to build like a, a content business or trying to build that consistency on LinkedIn, I mean, for me, it's, it is arguably probably, you know, it's in my top three priorities of the day, if not my, my top priority, because if I'm not writing on LinkedIn and, prov and share my expertise, what the hell am I doing? Um, you know, and if, if people don't know about what I can provide, it's not, a, it's not an add-on, it's not an addition. It's, it, it literally is what I need to be doing. You know, I'm here to help people in the higher ed sector. Um, and the easiest way I can do that is to share those thoughts on LinkedIn. And, you know, the, the, the kind of thing that sealed it for me was I was originally going to write like a long form blog post on on how to do like content marketing in, in a higher ed institution. And I actually did the maths and thought, well, you know, I could get like a thousand views on this one piece or I could write every day in LinkedIn and break things down and go into ideas in more detail and have conversations about people and you know, that was a decision. I thought, why publish it on my own website when I can just share it where people are and, 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 and yeah. talk to them? Yeah. You know, again, we've we've all had a lot of focus on building our own sort of properties. And it's important to have like an email newsletter. It's important to have your own website, but it shouldn't be at the expense of actually getting your content seen. Um, yeah. yeah. It applies to higher ed as well, doesn't it? So, you know, there's a lot of Yeah, it's, and I think it all just, yeah, depends on like, yeah, what, what stage are you at? Like once you've earned the right, like once you've proven right yourself on, on social or on, on platforms of, of, of distribution on these, on these networks, then you've, then you've earned the right to be like, no, 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 no. Like if you, if you want the good stuff, you, you know, you, you come over to my house, right. And my house <laughs> is built on, on this domain, right. Like, but, but I think like so many of us, like we, we try in higher ed, we focus like, like the number, anytime I do see staff in higher ed posting about something, it's like, come and visit our, you know, come and check out our recruitment event, three exclamation points or, or like, you know, come to this lunch and learn. And it's a link, right. To a landing page. Well, yeah. you know, anyone that's read anything about LinkedIn knows that like links like that, like the algorithm is not going to pick it up. LinkedIn doesn't want to send people away from their platform. They want to keep them on it. Right. Like, yeah. and those simple things, it's like, changing the way that you think about that, especially if, if you're hungry to grow and, and you need, you need new attention, you got to go and, and play in the sandbox where everyone's playing. If you've garnered that attention already, then you can invite them, you know, to come to your house for a play date, right? Or for dinner or whatever. But like until then, right, you got to get on their turf. Can you imagine the power of an institution, like a niche institution that was known for like one topical area 
just sharing all of that insight and value natively in like a LinkedIn feed or any social feed like daily, how how infamous it would become, you know, um so such opportunity for universities to do this in, in the future and, and get a bit of practice in now, I think. Um because increasingly people just won't discover you via your your web content. I mean if you what is it like um two thirds of Google searches now just don't end in a click, you know, because most yeah, of the content yeah. is served in, in that environment. You know, people, you know, it, we're moving to this mode of discovery and then, you know, people get in touch with you when they are ready to. They don't want to be interrupted. I mean, how many messages do you, do you receive in your inbox and it's just promotional? You just delete it, don't you? You don't want to engage yeah. on someone else's terms. You want to get in touch when when you're ready to to do that. So, you know, moving away from that idea of the, the funnel and all that sort of thing to one more based around discovery or at least taking some elements of discovery and incorporate it in with those models is, for me i think that's where the next five years are for sure yeah well dude this has been this has been amazing um i could i could talk with you all day uh where, where should folks who are listening in and you know i know that we've actually had you on the pod at least once if not twice before so um, but for folks who, I think you were still wearing your Unibuddy hat then. So yes. for folks who want to <laughs> learn a little bit more about you and, and what you're building, what's beyond LinkedIn, which, uh, you know, of course we'll have your profile link below. Is there, what, what's your website? What are, what are other ways you'd like to connect with folks? Yeah. My, my website is just called educationmarketer.co.uk because you should name your business after the category you're in it makes sense doesn't it <laughs> um <laughs> yeah, that's that's where you can subscribe to my my uh, fortnightly newsletter if you enjoy this sort of stuff that zach and i are talking about it's a good place to go and yeah linkedin like you said is i'm always there so just message me anytime wonderful all right man well this has been a a privilege um thanks for thanks for hopping on and looking forward to staying connected best of luck to you and everything you're building thank you you too take care Hey, y'all, Zach here from Enrollify. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Enrollify podcast. If you like this episode, do us a huge favor and hit that follow and subscribe button below. Furthermore, if you've got just two minutes to spare, we would greatly appreciate you leaving a rating and a review of this show on Apple Podcasts. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. But Enrollify is far more than just a podcast network. Enrollify is where higher ed comes to learn new marketing skills, discover new products and services, and find their next job. We're a growing, learning community of 4,000 members, and we'd love to welcome you into the fold. You can access our free blog articles, newsletters, e-courses, and more, or purchase our master course on how to market a university with Terry Flannery at enrollify.org. We look forward to meeting you soon and welcoming you into the community. Again, you can subscribe for free at enrollify.org.